Welcome to Talatera, a podcast about freelance educators working in natural resource fields and environmental education. Who are these educators? What do they do? Join me and let's find out together. This is your host, Tanya Marion. it's Tanya. Today we reflect on the green spaces where we live. Beyond parks and gardens, we sometimes find green spaces inside buildings, between buildings, on tops of buildings, in parking lots, and in places we may not expect to find them. When we do find them, we may not recognize them as green spaces, yet we experience the restful changes in mood these spaces were designed to create. Today, we get to learn from someone who creates these types of spaces for a living. Sonia Bocart is a lead accredited independent professional whose expertise is in interior design, health and wellness, and regenerative design. She leads workshops, is a sought after speaker, and is a TEDx presenter. Let's join the conversation. For a long time, I have noticed spaces that feel like open space, even though it's an urban setting. Even in a Las Vegas casino, a waterfall feature or something like that feels different than everything else. Those types of spaces have always stood out for me, but I didn't know until much later that there was a field that created those types of spaces, you know, that there was a name, that there were organizations like the Project for Public Spaces and Biophilic Cities and all that, that that is what they did. And and when I came across them, and I don't remember how I did, how I initially found them, I, you know, I subscribed to the newsletters and I've been following them loosely as an observer, distant observer. And... Your presentation was the first present, first formal presentation I ever attended about biophilic design and planning. And I'm just absolutely thrilled that you are here to today because creating those types of environments in the, in the built environment is just exciting to me. So may I ask you to introduce yourself, please, to listeners? Of course. And thank you so much for inviting me. My name is Sonia Bocart, and I am a biophilic designer. (laughs) And my work in the world is to foster human nature connection through design. And it is absolutely about the gestures you describe from the water feature (laughs) in a casino that we can can certainly get some benefit from that. but it's having more of those moments. And it's having more of those moments so that we are really in theory, experiencing the essence of nature of really who we are. And movement moving out of those moments of tension and busyness and that real urban landscape and, and having those moments that we can actually think clearly and heal and really connect with our truest selves. Can you describe what biophilic design is and and what drew you towards this field? Sure. So I knew from an early age that I wanted to be in the healing arts. And it was between two two choices I had uh, that I wanted to make uh, when I was considering the college path. And one of them was naturopathic physician because I had been immersed in how powerful that type of medicine was for one of my family members on his journey. And that of being a designer because I was very intrigued about space, space planning design elements, although I really had no skill going into it, I was intrigued. And I, 
I, I actually came out of college with a design degree, but I had found myself drawn towards wanting to make a difference in the world through healing, through design. And so I spent the first 10 years of my career working specifically in healthcare design, healing environments, very evidence-based. I learned a lot about planning, hospitals, outpatient design, wellness clinics. And it was about 10 years into my career, I had a bit of a personal crisis. <laughs> and I found myself drawn personally more towards the healing arts, towards yoga, meditation, mindfulness, nature. And it was so powerful to me. I was drawn towards teaching and I, I loved that world too. And I was compelled to find a way to bring them together. And I maybe through a little bit of maturity and <laughs> taking some, taking some risk, I did start to bridge those worlds. And I did that through bringing mindfulness and even movements of the body, like just moving energy, considering things like deepening my knowledge with indigenous, indigenous ways of, of, of knowing and of wisdom to the design practice, to the creative process. And biophilia emerged for me about that time. I learned about this theory of our innate connection to the natural world. Oh, biophilia, love of life, is really who we are. We are nature. We've spent over 99% of our evolution deeply connected to the natural world. So it's encoded, embedded within us. And so this, this amazing intersection of the will to create healing through design, through the healing arts and through nature all came together for me about 10 years ago. And biophilic design as a response is really taking all of those elements that we feel when we're immersed in our favorite place in nature, whether it's a forest or a beach or our, even our own backyard, it's that full sensory experience. And it's, it's how do we start to bridge that connection? How do we take those environments that we're healing and, and even those environments that we're learning in, that our children are learning, that we're living in, that we're working in, those need to be expressed in those ways too. So that, that's my work in the world. <laughs> Have you always worked independently or did you work for a firm when you started? I've actually worked primarily for large architecture firms. And my first project was, my first uh, major project was the UCLA Ronald Reagan Replacement Hospital at, at uh, UCLA. And it was a million square foot facility. And I was one of the lead planners for the fourth floor. I still remember it's the fourth floor. It was 20 years ago. <laughs> it was the behavioral health floor. It was very, very um, challenging to create a healing environment. It was an incredible challenge. And I wished I would have known more about biophilic design at that time. It would have, it would have really helped me respond to the to my work in that space. And uh, when did you make the move to work independently, have your own firm? When I started to wake up. <laughs> so when I realized that, although I was incredibly grateful for the time I've had and the partners I've had and the support of larger organizations, I realized in order to express myself fully, and to, to do the work in ways that felt true to me and expansive and like nature, right? If I'm going to be fostering human nature connection, teaching others to do it, working on these projects in dynamic ways, I needed to connect to my truest ways of working and knowing. 
And I realized I could only do that by tuning into myself and perhaps having more freedom. <laughs> With that, I will be very clear that it was a risk in many ways. I do feel I am, um, <laughs> I abandon a sense of security and comfort, but the rewards are amazing. Like I just feel like I breathe deeper. I take a break and I go and garden when I want to, and I feed the soul. I mean, I would encourage everyone to consider those opportunities and th to take those leaps when they can, because that's the, that's the way we will bring more healing to the world. Yeah. How did you embrace possibility? What was that moment that, that okay, now I need to do this now? Well, I think we're all given some signs. We're getting, we're given signs, right? And it's advice I give to myself <laughs> and I give to other people about finding quiet moments, finding your, that, the way to hear that inner voice. You know, for me, it's meditation and it's time in nature. Um, it's journaling, it's the creative arts. And I'm able to tune in very clearly tune into my intuition. And so I'm working at this great firm. I was actually promoted not long before I left and my work was going well there. Your, your work does not need to be collapsing. It does not need to be failing to give you a sign that it's, it's time. But I just went in one day and I just started cleaning out my desk. <laughs> I'm like, I don't really know what this path is forward but I know I need to take it. And the other thing for me, I actually did work with a wonderful uh, professional life coach at that time. And she had me go through some body-centered exercises of feeling the different options. What would it feel like in my body to stay? And that experience felt very secure, grounded, yet rigid. And then to be more part-time in that experience felt like, wow, okay, I'm starting to, to feel a little more alive, right? And in that exercise, she also had me envision what it would be like to be out on my own. And I even get chills to this day thinking about it because uh, it was bold and like I envisioned myself working really hard. Like I knew, like in that moment, I realized I'm going to be working super hard and I'm going to feel alive like I've never felt it before. And I even had a sort of flash forward of envisioning my future self, <laughs> giving my current self encouragement. If that makes any sense, I had this like serendipitous, extraordinary moment of knowing. So whatever resources, wherever your comfort is in exploring your options and your path, trusting that, listening to that inner voice, listening to those signs. And so I did, I cleaned out my desk and I gave my notice and I moved on. <laughs> yeah. That makes total sense, the fast forward connection with your future self talking to your yourself at that time yeah sometimes you you just know yeah I can't explain it and your first project then as an independent practitioner was what so I went out on my own and my daughter at that time was about six so I was looking forward to some time with her so I wasn't trying to control exactly how I wanted to work. I wasn't even sure. Um, <laughs> and then uh, my husband was laid off like two months after I quit my job. <laughs> that, yeah, so like maybe I do want to um, move back into my, and, and I would consider a more focused uh, consideration for financial aspects in my life due to that. Um, right. So that was another sign 
you're not going to take too much of a break. Let's kind of like, let's get going a little bit, which was perfectly fine. I started to just put it out into the world. I had had some clients before that um, I kept in touch with. And through word of mouth, I got invited to be a part of a team for a project that was going after the most rigorous green building certification program in the world. It's called the Living Building Challenge. And biophilic design is deeply embedded and an integral part of that certification. And in order to meet that certification, project teams need to, are required to participate in an all day exploration of how that building, how that project can express connection to the natural world. And so I had been doing some of this. I had been leading the workshops and I was invited onto this project and it was bigger than anything I had ever done. And my time frame on it was incredibly short to plan and organize the workshop. I just stepped into it. I used that intuition. I said, I'm just going to do this. I can do this. And I did. I led the workshop for over 60 people. The building is now complete. It's the Candida Building for Innovative Sustainable Design at Georgia Tech's campus. And it just got the full Living Building Challenge certification. It's beautiful. The the co-creative process is is incredible when you get interdisciplinary an interdisciplinary team at the table to work together on co-creating you have your landscape architect you have your owner maybe a biologist at the table a staff member that's going to work there right i mean you diverse creative and everyone's not only working together in these workshops this for this one it was a day and a half exploration They're not only thinking about their own roles and their contributions for the project. So what what will the habitat be like around the building? How can people interact? Will there be an edible garden? Where are the water features? You know, we're we're considering all those possibilities, but we, I also have the team step into the role of considering different occupants that would be using that building and visiting that building. So I had like six different personas and what that, just to give you a little glimpse into it, what, what giving personas does to a team, it allows them to play and play is so important in the creative process. So they were like envisioning what it would be like for a gentleman, mid, mid-aged, we gave him a name, <laughs> you know, like he had a persona and I, I integrated with a, uh, a historian there in Atlanta to help me shape these personas. So they were very real. And very, quite often these personas are also underserved, underprivileged people of color. Um, because we need those, we need these places to not only be expressions of connection to nature, they need to bring bring more healing into our communities. So that was very much a part of that workshop in that process. and. And so my approach to considering biophilic design is that it is not prescriptive and it is very place sourced and it's place based and it's people sourced. So yeah, that was a great project. When you design a project and after you've met with stakeholders and you've come to understand the place, to know the place the way that you need to know them, how do you decide what elements to bring in? There are so many different elements to choose from. What do you consider as important for any particular place? What helps you make those decisions? Well, I will first say that I am a facilitator and I'm a resource. And I I lead the creative process. And my role on the project is to open... (laughs) open this experience for creation. And so I do that with a series of tools, not tools in a mechanical way, like tools in a playful, organic, experiential way, so that the team 
has all of these resources. And I will say it, I'm, I'm kind of going a little back door into your question, but it's important, I think, to express the foundation for these workshops. Um, the first thing, the most important thing is to tune people into place. So a lot of times I will do that through opening them up to their own biophilic self. So their own human nature connection. So usually it starts with people and whether it's a visioning session, a mindfulness exercise, sometimes in smaller groups, I ask them to bring something that is speaks to them from nature. And a lot of times they gravitate towards elements that they remember as children. And through that experience, it opens them up. It rekindles that love of life. And because for, for, for most of us, we've forgotten it. For most of the Western society, we've become very mechanistic and very disconnected, sadly. So that's the time for teams to just say, okay, this feels good. I know this. I remember this. And then usually they're sharing. So they're sharing with partners. They're sharing with tables. So you can kind of connect to people and their stories and their place. And what, what I'm doing there, I'm building a field of vitality. And from that point, usually we go out onto the site. And optimally, I want them to kind of tune in. I'll, I might even ask them to not speak, but just to walk the site quietly and observe. And what we're, what we're doing in these places is that we're, we're, we're observing not only the patterns that are there, like what are, what are the habitats? What are the sounds? What are some of the, you know, the experiences of that place? But also what's missing, right? Are there certain sounds of animals that are missing? Are there certain experiences? Are there sounds of the city that are really loud that we want to try to minimize with the project? So that's the foundation. And then we come back <laughs> into a room together, usually, and we tune in together. We talk about their experience. And then at that point, it's like, okay, let's talk about biophilic design. For me, that category of biophilic design elements, that organization has been best described and categorized by Dr. Stephen R. Kellert with Yale University. And Dr. Kellert, before he passed a few years ago, he, he just wrote numerous books and wonderful papers bridging biophilia, you know, the experiences of nature into ways for us to look at biophilic design elements. And he did this in six major elements and over 70 attributes. So the elements are direct connection with nature. So environmental features. So that's everything from sunlight, habitat, biodiversity, water, daylight, to natural shapes and forms, which are going to be those shells and spirals and, you know, forms of nature, really organic, resisting the straight line. There's light in space, which reminds us of the importance of daylight to nourish our circadian rhythms, which are regulating our sleep and wake cycles, our mood and our development. And also with light and space, it's that realization that light is dynamic. And in our spaces and our schools and our workplaces, there should be variation. There should be light and shadow and warm light, soft light, spacious light. So just helping people tune into that variation. The fourth element is natural patterns and processes. So that is about reminding us that we are deeply connected to the rhythms of life, the ebb and flow. And we need to consider our senses in spaces tactile qualities, sounds of nature, maybe spaces that are really quiet so we can just think, <laughs> you know, that's, that's equally part of it. Um, and then using materials that change over time, like copper and core 10 steel. So we remember we're, site, we're part of that cycle of life. The fifth element is placed-based relationships. And those are patterns that remind us to go out and bring in our ecologist into the conversation, 
bring in indigenous knowledge, bring in the history of place. And Dr. Keller has a beautiful pattern in that element. It's called spirit of place. It is my favorite. So how do we take all of the past and the needs for the program in the building and, and create something that is something people love and care about? And again, that supports human and ecological health. And then the last element is human nature evolved relationships. And this is how we shape spaces to be conducive to experiences that we want to facilitate. And the example I'll give with this, um, with this element is the one that is usually well known. And I think it's one of the most powerful patterns and that is prospect and refuge. So given that we've spent this expansive amount of time evolving in nature and so much of that time on the, the savanna, right? And that hunter and gatherer um, experience being genetically encoded within us, there is evidence that we as humans physically and physiologically feel comforted when we have those moments in the built environment where maybe our backs are kind of rooted against a wall and maybe there's a lower ceiling and we can have a feel like we can have a more intimate conversation or maybe we can find respite and rest and then we can look out and see prospect right so that's kind of takes us back <laughs> thousands of years in our evolution but how can we create those moments in our spaces moments for beauty and attraction so that's all the behavioral aspects so there are there are a number of ways, absolutely. Your process that you describe seems to me that it would be easy to get people on board. Have you ever experienced resistance to the idea of biophilic design? Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> so um, there are a number of barriers to integrating biophilic design on projects. So the first one is that people just have fallen into a habit of design by numbers. Um, yeah, literally designed by numbers. So how fast can we get this building up? How, how budget conscious can we be on this project? And the, the problem with the mentality on those types of conventional building projects are that they're really only thinking about short term, day one. They're not thinking that this building will likely be around for 50, 70 years, maybe longer. And in that duration, in that trajectory, what is it? Frank Lloyd Wright had a saying, he said, buildings too are children of earth and sun, <laughs> right? So our buildings are going to hold our human experience and they're either going to help us thrive and help us breathe deeper. I we really haven't even talked about, you know, what the what the research says about biophilic design, but we've got to get out of that habit. We have to get out of our habits of thinking of buildings as commodities. And we've got to start honoring our place and that's for me, why so much of my learning is rooted in understanding how the indigenous people approach their connection with the earth and life, because whether it's through our lifestyle or through how our buildings are being designed, we're destroying our mother, really. I mean, our water quality, our air quality, our resources, our soil, what we're doing to the forest. So I truly believe that if we, and I've seen through the research, if we start designing differently, we will start living differently and we'll start honoring more of that connection. So that's one of the barriers is just being in habits and thinking about um, initial cost. Um, and I, I want to explain that cost is also cost does not have to be a barrier as these types of visioning sessions are created from day one 
then we're married and and in integrative ways so you have the contractor i mean this is about this co-creative process is about empowering the team so when you have the owner in the room and you have optimally your contractor we're breaking down silos everything's integrated we're all moving towards a vision then we can think about what are those windows going to cost and how do we make this happen So upfront design considerations will help to minimize cost impact. Um, they also get team members more engaged in the process. So I feel as though there's a more vested interest. There's more satisfaction from people working on projects like this because they're more satisfied. Um, everyone wants to be creative. No one wants to design by numbers, design in prescriptive ways. The, the third conser- consideration of a barrier to biophilic design is just lack of knowledge and understanding of the value of what biophilia and biophilic design does for us. Everything from the physical health benefits of that have been shown to reduce blood pressure, regulate heart rates, calm our nervous systems, move us into the parasympathetic healing mechanism of the body, um, reduce stress, <laughs> you know, all of that translates into what is being proven within these environments, which is like for healthcare, more rapid healing rates, so shorter lengths of stay, less reduction of pain medication, happier, healthier caregivers. Oh my goodness, our caregivers out in these these organizations, my heart goes out to them, especially right now. They are fatigued. They are incredibly worthy of having these environments to, to, to help support them. They need them. And everything we do for these caregivers translates into patient care, into the patient experience. In our learning environments, better test scores, better overall learning rates, less anxiety from students, happier students. And then in our workplaces, higher productivity, higher creativity, less absenteeism. And then I would just like to mention the studies that are being done on the city scale. You mentioned biophilic cities. So on the city scale, we're finding less crime less anxiety, um, more community connection. And, and there's even studies that have been done on um, youth self-discipline. So just, and, and community, community connectivity. So we're seeing green space in our cities resonating to healthier and happier places. So we need this at all scales, (laughs) really. How can listeners advocate for biophilic design in their communities? Who should they be speaking with? So as my mentors share with me, you work from where you're at, you're right. So it's just taking one step at a time and working where you can affect change. Sometimes that's in your workplace, inquiring, asking, suggesting for changes, um, requesting plant programs in buildings, um, schools. So meeting with school boards. In hospitals, the same thing. I mean, we need to reach the decision makers. They're the ones that really can advocate for this change. Um, But I believe very strongly that everyone has a voice and I also encourage people to, um, and my students, not to get overwhelmed by the many aspects of biophilic design, the six elements, the 70 attributes, or the, you know, the patterns, um, because this is really who we are. And the more, the more we can spend time in nature and go to our public gardens, go to local museums, learn from indigenous people, like tune into it on our own and live this way, 
bring more plants in, plant a garden. I mean, live it. And that, as I found, will start to translate into your community, into your neighborhood. Even if you're just doing this on a personal level and inviting people into your garden, grow a new plant. I mean, you can work on so many different capacities to be promoting this change. When you look over your shoulder and look at the trail you've left behind, what do you see? Well, I like to go into the spaces that I've been a part of helping to co-create. And it's really amazing when you can uh, just serendipitously hear someone talking about the space. Oh, this wood grain is amazing, you know, or oh, this artwork, look at this. You know, I, I, I get a lot of pleasure out of just knowing that people are inspired and feel comfortable and alive in these spaces. But I, I you know, I don't get to spend a, a great deal of time in, in the projects. Um, and so I, I do watch the the movement of students that maybe I've taught and that have that are going on to do amazing things in the world. Um, I like to see that and that's very inspiring. And I suppose I just don't spend a great deal of time thinking about the work I've done. Uh, I spend a great deal of time kind of in the present moment just Trying a lot to trying not to look back, saying what I should have done because I'm, I'm I think maybe that's the, just the ego coming up, saying oh, oh I could have brought this in or you know that's just my constant um, <laughs> drive to do better and to think more expansively and to think more wholly. So I'd say that's probably more of my my mentality is to think about how to evolve and how to keep going and how to do more with the work and how to inspire change. What's next for you? Well, that's fun. Um, I am I'm developing more ideas on spirit of place, really. I think that's what draws me in for the most part and what compels me. I think it's always really wonderful to see buildings and places that have biophilic design patterns. But you know a place that has spirit of place, and I'm not speaking specifically of places of worship. I'm speaking about everyday buildings that you walk into and you just, you feel so good in, you feel comforted, and you know that it has a, a healing energy to it. And so I'm specifically compelled to be doing more work with those patterns and to be sharing that information. So I'm I'm working more on that within my projects. I'm more with spirituality, really, and and the co-creative process because it's not just those patterns, which I think I would say are you know things like sacred geometry and certain ways of of integrating color and form. And so I'm still in the exploratory stages for exactly what that is, but it is still about that co-creative process. So I'm very passionate about being that bridge to help teams and people on a path to, uh, I suppose, become more indigenous with their thinking, to be more tuned into place, to be more connected as a person when they're thinking about these places and their own role on projects. So it's the what of Spirit of Place, it's the patterns, and it's really so much about the how. And just getting bolder in experiences like nature immersion on projects and mindfulness and yeah i think so much to me the core of the work is around interconnections and relationships so i'm exploring those interconnections that's wonderful and we are lucky to have you exploring that so lucky sonia thank you so much for introducing us to your work and biophilic design and for showing us something we can no longer unsee. It has been my pleasure. Thank you so very much.
To learn more about Sonia, her work, and to view upcoming events, please visit the show notes for this episode. Here you will find additional links to resources that were mentioned during our conversation. Thank you for joining us today. See you next time. Terra is a podcast for and about independent educators working in natural resource fields and environmental education. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with friends and colleagues. Thank you so much for joining us today. This is Tanya Marion.